We'll be starting in just about two minutes. Those of you who are here early, hello, welcome. Hello, Vanessa. Hello, Paul. Hello, Dan, Kate. Hello, Rhea. Hello, Tom. Hello, Martha. Hello, John. Hello, Barb. Good to see you all. Just playing a little video clip assembled by a good friend of the program, Roxanne Riskin. We'll be starting in about two minutes. And thank you, Roxanne, for assembling that awesome video. Please, in the text, if you all could just say a couple of words of thanks to Roxanne, a little bit of applause for going above and beyond uh, to make that. And while you're doing that, it's the top of the hour. So let's begin. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum for a very, very special day. I'm delighted to see you all here right now. And I'm delighted that we can all be here for this special event. I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the co-host or the host and uh, the cat herder uh, for the uh, next hour. And I'm really, really looking forward to our celebration today. Uh, to begin with, let me just uh, help introduce the forum to those of you who haven't been here for a bit or who are new here. But also, I want to just use this moment to quickly reflect back on everybody, uh, what we've done what we've accomplished, and uh, what you've all done together. Now, just to take your minds back five years ago to this day, February 11th, 2016, we had our first forum. You have to remember that at that point, we really weren't universally committed to video conferencing. Not everybody was uh, hip deep in Zoom or Shindig or Teams or anything else. Video conferencing was a kind of nice to have extra. And we decided to create something unusual. We decided to create a, a venue for people to discuss the future of higher education over video. And we did this, uh, launched in Vermont, where we had terrible bandwidth. Um, and we did this using a startup technology, Shindig. And we've been going ever since. It's just remarkable to think about how many people have been here what a variety of people have been here. You know, just how many faculty, researchers, librarians, technologists, students, presidents, all from within higher education and beyond higher education, government officials, political candidates, nonprofit heads, startup funders and founders. Uh, we've had critics, we've had boosters, we've had all kinds of folks from literally from around the world. And I'm just, it's just astonishing to think about. In fact, here, let me go a little further still. Right now, the total number of guests that we've hosted is close to 300 over time. And the number of participants, uh, I'm actually having a hard time calculating it, but it's in the tens of thousands right now, which is truly amazing. We have, as of this morning, 241 recordings on YouTube. So each of those is free, open for anybody to play with. And on our email announcement list, we have nearly 8,000 people. And those are all people who decide to be there. They could all leave at any moment, and we have that many there right now, actively participating in what we do together. 
I mean, if, if you look ahead, and we're going to do that today, to where we're going next, just think about the variety of sessions that we've all been co-creating together. And we have a session next week on e-learning with one of the world's great scholars on the subject. We have a session on how to support equity and diversity in higher education. We have two different university presidents, one from the East Coast and one from the West, each talking about their very different ways of reinventing public higher education. We have a guest who's going to be from MIT talking about the science of learning. I mean, there's really, it's an extraordinary glimpse of where high rate could be going in just these four sessions. Now, we've worked with supporters over the past five years to help make this happen. And I want to thank a couple of them because they're stalwarts. Uh, if you think about NYSERNet in New York State, one of the great things is they kind of offer us a model and that they are a distributed network. They're a group that runs across that pretty large state, working with a wide range of higher education. They do also a wide range of professional development and research. That's a nice kind of model for that distributed network community uh, that we're doing right now. And we're grateful to them for their support. And we've also been using Shindig. And we have Shindig's founder and CEO on the call, um, Steve Gottlieb, and we'll bring him up in a bit. Uh, but Shindig has been terrific as a great partner, helping us um, really grow over the years. And we've been pleased to watch them grow and develop as they move from strength to strength, too. Again, just for today, if, if you haven't been to uh, the forum for a while or if you're new to the Shindig technology, uh, just to give you a quick primer, where I am right now, this is the stage. This is where we can host a wide variety of content, including each of you. So here, let me just put up Roxanne's video because uh, there we go. See, this is the one that uh, Roxanne Riskin made, if you didn't get to see it before. And this is where all of our guests can be. Now below us, you should see around you up to 20 or so people at a time. And this is what other people would call the audience, what I call the community or the participant swarm. If you look around you right now, I'm logged in. I can see folks like Joe Murphy. I can see Rhea Kelly. Um, I can see Julie Meyer. And each of those people is there. And they usually represent one person, sometimes several around the table. And you can access any of them just by reaching out to them on a one to one basis. Now, if you want to talk with us today, simply reach down on the bottom of the screen, click that raised hand button, and that'll beam you up on stage so you can join us. In fact, I'm going to put up a podium so that anybody who wants to join us can just press that teal color button and appear here on stage with us. Now, if you want to type, if you'd like to add more comments, just use the chat box. Already we have a bunch of people who are uh, applauding uh, Roxanne or calling me a cult leader um, all in the chat box. That works as well. If you want to share a question by text because you can't do video right now, no problem. Just go down to the uh, Q&A button. That's a question mark. and type in a question and we'll flash it up on stage. We're really, really grateful to Shindig for making this available and for working with us so closely for the past five years. And I also want to share another crowd and updated list of that, how the supporters on Patreon. So keep in mind that on Patreon, I've been working with these folks who've been giving us ideas, answering questions, floating topics, bringing up themes for us to explore. And the folks on this list have actually been contributing $10 or more a month to keep everything going which is pretty amazing just to think about. Here, let me just bring them all, so you can see them all. Folks like Vicky Tambellini, Colleen Carmine, Jeannie Kim Han, William O'Shea, Corey S., Phil Long, Janet McClellan, Rebecca, Therese Davis, or sorry, Teresa Travis, Cliff Lynch. It's just been great to work with all of them and to have their support. Now, on top of that, on top of that, whoop, hang on a second, just managed to lose my slides. Let me bring them right back. And yes, um, and Frenzy points out, boy, have things changed indeed. I wanted to make sure that we could recognize today the unusual achievement of where we are. Now that video conferencing is mandatory for most of the world, now that we live, thanks to the pandemic, in this virtual environment more deeply than ever before, I think what we've all done together through the forum gives us something to be especially proud of. We have a warm, thoughtful, welcoming, provocative community 
that lets us collaboratively explore the future of higher education. I don't think there's anything like it in the world. And I'm delighted to be there with you all. Now today, I had a few plans for things I'd like to do. I'd like to give away a few books. My most recent book, Academia Next. I'd like to give away some t-shirts. And by the way, I don't know if you can tell, this is a t-shirt here, logo created by Roxanne. Look at that. I'd like to have a chance for us to reflect on what we've done and to brainstorm the next five years. So one of the themes of today is forward to 2026 which is a long time to think about, but not for you all, because you were all already this great at being this forward looking. And we had, had a question that just popped up. I wanna bring this up on the stage so everyone can see it. This is from Anne Fenzi at University of Maine. Hello, Anne. Now that video chat is a normal, but many of us have been advocating this for years. What else have we been advocating for that will finally make it into the mainstream? Oh, great question, Anne. Great question. I would love to hear from everybody else. If you'd like to join her by answering this, just you know, press the teal button right here or throw some more questions up in the chat. I'll just say that I mean, online learning as a whole is something that's obviously really, really taken off. And hopefully doing it deeply and more effectively is something that will also take off. What a great question, Anne. I hope you're staying warm with all that snow there as well. Bob, I can't get you a t-shirt or the beard, but I'm thinking about making some of these beards. Uh, Myron, as you know, as a, as a costume uh, accessory. Myron Williams says something really sweet. I just want to make sure you guys all can hear this. This forum has been a great help to me as I moved into leadership and distance learning. Many of the people here have been great help off light as well and make my work more effective. Thank you. Myron, thank you, that's great to hear. I think it's one of the benefits of a community like this is that we get to work together uh, and really learn from each other. It's a fantastic networking environment. Uh, Ryan, I can see, aha, there you are, Ryan. Do I see your photo, but I don't see a video. Is your camera working? I'm not getting any audio either. Uh, tell you what, Ryan, uh, what, let me just take you down off the podium for a second, uh, and why don't you just reload this page and then uh, try again? Sometimes that really clears things up. Oh, no problem, Ryan. Just reload the page, see how it goes. Joe, why don't you join us here on stage? We'd like to hear from you. Uh, Martha adds um, one answer to the things that we've been talking about for years that have now gone mainstream is working remotely, and that's definitely true. Joe Murphy, hello. Brian, hello. Uh, Great. Thank you and congratulations on uh, five years of something, which I, I will again say I'm, I, am a, I am a better webinar facilitator for watching how you do it and how many of your guests have done it. So, so thank you. Thank you so um, much. That. So in terms of, uh, this is kind of both a, a what else is going to go mainstream and maybe it's a suggestion, what else should the FTTE community be practicing so that we're more informed and more ready? Um, mm. Since since we're never going to have to tell anyone ever again that video conferencing is a thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wonder to what extent the answer might be thinking about going back toward the written word. Um, and you know, I, I think about the terrific work that you do with the uh, with the Future Trends Report. Um, and I don't know exactly what this looks like for this community, but I wonder if there's some way that we might be able to hone our skills on kind of report outs and for it turns out forum discussion is not you know written forum discussion is not that easy and maybe those are areas where as professionals we might want to think about venues where we can practice that skill so we're a little more ready to teach and apply it elsewhere but I, w I was interested in the question about, you know, what's uh, to the extent that we've benefited from 
practicing this skill, I wonder what the benefits of practicing, what the, what the next skill we should be practicing is. Well, do you think it might be the uh, bringing new light to how to uh, manage and facilitate text-based discussions online, uh, just discussion boards? Thank you. That sums it up exactly. Yeah. And I just mentioned discussion boards. I'm thinking of my class tonight, uh, but but also to think about blogging, to think about uh, other sources, including Discord. Um, yeah. Oh, this is a great idea. Um, to thank you. And don't go away. Uh, stick okay. around. Uh, after all, you have a great beard, so. <laughs> well, we should we should be in inclusive of all levels of. Uh, for regularity, <laughs> <laughs> I think so. We we have a question from Bob Klein. He says, "I would hope that we would better understand and support the fact that people's lives don't go away while they work. Things happen in the background. Now, with remote communication, Zoom, etc., our lives are really happening in the background. That's a great point. Uh, but and it, it makes me think of some of the fantastic people that we've hosted, like Sarah Goldert Rab, for example." who've really drawn attention to the changing social dynamics of so many students. Uh, and for the past year, uh, from uh, both COVID and uh, Black Lives Matter, how we've really paid a lot more attention to equity uh, and, uh, and how that works. Let me just put up another uh, uh, podium so people can join us uh, as they like. Uh, Julie Pollard um, notes as well, now that video meetings are more accessible, geography is less of a challenge. When it comes to international collaboration, will we see more internationalization of curriculums through global partnerships? Julie, that's a fantastic idea. Um, if you've seen any examples or hints of this, please uh, let us know. Uh, if you want to join us, either uh, say more in chat or especially join us up here on stage, we'd be uh, glad to hear that. Um, and Tom Hames recommends paradigm shifting. All right, now the thing about Tom is that he tries to avoid being called on every time. And what happens is I call on him every time, and then I bring him up on stage. And then I talk about his clothing, and I talk about his background, and then he says something actually very deep and thoughtful. Uh, Tom, <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you. Hey. Oh, and oh, uh, hang on one second. I just want to show off something. Now that you're here, check this out. Mm -hmm. See, this yeah. is a, a new feature of uh, a new feature. They have a zit right here. No. Well, you just ruined it completely. No, this is so this <laughs> uh, I like this a lot. It feels like a. Um, it gives people a <clears throat> picture. If you, people me you remember when TV went to HD and 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 how many uh, you know newscasters and TV stars suddenly discovered that they weren't built for HD. Mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing's happening here, right? Oh, no, no. I think, uh, I think it's more precisely for you. It's good to see it. Um, so uh, did you ha did you want me to elaborate or what? What, yeah. Yeah, it's what, what, what are you putting me on the spot for here, Brian? Well, just to, um, in general yeah. purposes, but also you, you're talking about paradigm yeah. shifting. I wonder if you're going to fold that. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things that I think is, and I've said this before in the um, – uh, in, in other conversations and other contexts here on the forum is that uh, uh, the, you know, the pandemic has really forced us into using time and space and tools in new and interesting ways. Um, but I think a lot of times this paradigm is being, you know, this isn't unusual, but the paradigm that we operate under is slow to adapt. And in terms of things like thinking about what does it mean to be in class or not in class? What does it mean to be on when it comes to learning versus not on when it comes to learning? Um, you know, what, is, what do class sizes mean? What do sections mean? These are all, you know, questions that have become, let's say, interesting to ponder. I mean, I've always found them interesting to ponder, but... Um, uh, that we don't just sort of shift back into the old normal, which honestly, in many ways, does not work well in a digital environment. You know, for instance, to cite something really banal, um, you know, there's a lot of data that says you can't talk for more than uh, 30 or 40 minutes in an online environment without, you know, completely losing attention. Mm -hmm. You can't make videos for more than 10 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. And yet we continue to have hour and a half long classes or scheduled classes or, or, or even worse, three hour scheduled classes. 
And you really have to ask yourself as a teacher, where's the utility in that time? Uh-huh. And, and is there a better way to spread it out because you have more control over time in a digital environment? than you do in a, in, in a physical environment. In a physical environment, you're limited by the facilities manager who says, Tom has to be in this room at this time. It has 30 desks in it. Okay. That's his section size, right? And that's the thing that dictates everything else at that point. Um, uh, and uh-huh. everything sort of cascades from that. Yeah, now we've blown that up. The, uh, some, I don't know, so we really haven't in some ways. We still okay. have a lot of really dumb uh, thinking about some of these things. The other thing about remote, uh, and Melanie was, uh, I'm sorry, Martha was talking about being there, you know, um, you know, remote makes that a different kind of challenge than if you're sitting in a room with other people. And again, it's, uh, it's a time and space kind of thing where, you know, you have to put a special attention toward, you know, reaching out and 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 connecting with your students in a way that was a little more um, instinctual in a classroom environment, right? Um, and and again, that messes with okay. So, is it better for me to meet with a lot of students individually? Uh, is it better for me to be in a in a Zoom room with twenty or thirty students? I mean, which what, how what's the utility of that, right? So. I've done two things in my classes. I've split them in half time-wise, and I've split them in half student-wise. So I have smaller groups of students who are only supposed, to, who are only required to be there for, you know, half of the class time. The rest of it's done on on a asynchronous online thing, um, and that has two advantages. And again, that's diff- much more difficult to pull off in a physical environment because you're being driven by constraints that have nothing to do with teaching and learning. This is a great idea, and this is something for us to explore. Um, so I, I was just going to say, you reminded me of once I, I hosted the forum from Helsinki at a university, uh, talking about physical constraints, and the security closed the building I was in at the end of the hour. So I was picking up my laptop and walking through the building, and you could see the lights going off behind me um, as I was going out. So you know, <laughs> okay, security person, I was meant to be here, but. But let's let's take a look at your time question. Um, Kathy Pittman has a question, and then uh, um, that relies right it goes, it goes right to this. Uh, she asks, "Do you think this extra lines and technology makes it harder to unplug at the end of the day?" I think we need to rethink what that means. I mean, I think you know the what I find is I break up my day into smaller chunks. So I'll, I'll work really hard for a few hours in the morning and do a lot of the email and asynchronous kind of stuff and updating sites and that sort of thing. And then I do exercise. I go out and take a walk. I, you know, I, I, I break the routine and then I come back and I teach and then I have lunch and then I teach again. And then I, you know, then I, but I, and then I, it's again, why, why do I need to worry about a schedule of a building unless I have to meet people, Yeah, you know, come into a point where everybody's in the same place at the same time. At the rest of the time, I should work around what I need to do, right? Thank you. And it requires a mindset of being able to turn it off. I mean, to say, okay, I'm going to go do something else. That's you know, and it a lot of times that's really helpful. If I get stuck writing or something like that, taking a walk is the best thing to do. And you're good at that, and you have a great eye for doing that. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tom. Joe, do you want? I know you have some ideas about this about over reliance on technology. <laughs> how, how about this unplugging part? Um. I will admit that one of the things that I struggle with is the degree to which, yeah, I think that I think the degree to which reliance on literally the same devices um, creates a blurring between uh, between recreation and work, and I think that is a problem. Um, because I do not have the mental discipline uh, that Tom's referring to. It's hard for me to say I'm, I am not at work and I'm not going to check my work email. Um, and I am not going to feel bad about the fact that I am watching Netflix and not doing work. Um, 
One of the biggest benefits that I personally have had has been returning to a regular phone call with my closest friends in the world. We talk on the phone every Monday night. Um, and one of the benefits of that, is, I mean, one of the benefits is I don't have to look at myself. Um, I'm, I'm not on Zoom. My eyes can look across the, the room and probably get some much needed rest. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that there is, and, and some of this is specific to our current moment, I think there are some real problems in the ways that, um, you know, I, I, we, we might need more different devices to tell us this is this is where i am um at work or at home I, it's a problem that right now i'm sitting at my dining room table and that's that has messed up my meal planning because my dining room has somehow also become my office hmm. um, so so yeah i think these are very real problems and and now we're into you know architectural constraints right who has a room that they can be in their office in yes. is is a, another whole big problem someone was just on twitter saying having a private quiet space to do schoolwork in is an immense privilege uh, that's so, why i have these yeah. i make my own private space right yeah i mean i i, I work in a fairly public if you can sort of see behind me a little bit here you know, that's that's the rest of the house there. And most of the time, it's not an issue. My, my wife is working downstairs. We chose not to try to cram into the study together because it's just too tight. So I, I set up in the game room. Our kids don't really game very much anymore. They're getting too old for that. Um, but if somebody's running the TV downstairs, it's a bit of an issue, which usually isn't an issue except in the evenings. I'm doing an evening thing. Um, but I mean, I can, I, I if I need to shut out. I mean, I, I had the same problem when I used to work in an office with an open floor plan. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, and you have to put on headphones, yeah. right? Well, we had a couple of good good comments about this uh, in the chat. Uh, Mark Corbett Wilson says, recently overheard, we're not working from home. We're now living in an office. Uh, yeah. And then uh, <laughs> Martha Snyder says, I'm in my office, which is a closet slash office. Yeah, this is uh, this is this is a lot of these, fun. These are old arbitrary distinctions, I would say. I mean, I, I, I you know, you, you have to. These are mental constructs as much as they are physical constructs. Think about how much time you spend at the office goofing off in a given day, right? I mean, how much actual productive time, right? Versus, and then of course you factor in the amount of time you spend driving to and from said office. And for some people, that's considerable, right? Uh, and and all of that doesn't, you know. And I make that into productive time when I was driving because I would listen to podcasts and books and stuff like that, and that that was that was useful. Uh, but uh, um, you know, of course, I'm I'm way behind on all of that stuff now. I put less than seven thousand miles on my car last year. I'm I'm literally thinking of going into my office and just assuming that any piece of paper that is still on a surface since last March really needs to go into a hefty bag. <laughs> there, there can't be any way that's relevant to me doing my work anymore. It, it can't, or I was going to say set them on fire, but, but, they, um, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted to bring Kate Montgomery into the conversation because we were talking about space before. We mentioned international uh, dynamics to this. Uh, and already in the chat, one person said that I think the clawfish idea came from the prime minister of Turkey. <laughs> 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 You mentioned something great you were doing. You, you were talking about um, your uh, SMU doing uh, uh, international curriculum. Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So uh, we actually, I, I work in a graduate liberal studies program. We have doctors and master's students, and we do a lot of self-designed coursework and a lot of curricular innovation all the time. So we usually offer study abroad um, every summer. This summer we're grounded um, and one of the courses I'm designing has to do with organizational culture and a virtual immersion that is uh, hopefully setting the, the standard for traveling next summer. Um, but then going forward, I see that the pre-immersion for a study abroad next summer may have a virtual immersion component before going study abroad. So the days of 
packing up, studying abroad. And these are shorter trips for an adult learner. Um, so that that's the audience that we serve. We go for short bursts of time. And I think that it's going to be a combination going forward where we're using some virtual immersion to augment and enhance the in-person experience. So that's something that I could see us working on. Um, of course, we're knee deep right now. I just hung up with our study abroad offices today actually to find out when the, the bans, the travel bans will be lifted for a university. And that's part of the trick too. You have to plan out so far and yet you you yeah. can't do it last minute, but that that's part of the trick too. We talk about, we're not sure if the world going forward will ever make us 200% comfortable not to have a lot of flexibility and contingency in place should we you know, need uh -huh. to for whatever might happen. And one thing that did happen last uh, spring too, I was supposed to go to England and Scotland and I had some work in person with Oxford and that got scrapped because of COVID, but we were able to do a rework and do a lot of collaboration with Zoom and that kind of thing and try to build out the work uh, to the best we could, virtually speaking. Well, it's, uh, I'm sorry that you didn't get to go to uh, uh, the country that uh, used to be part of the European Union you were planning this. <laughs> but um, but I'm, I'm delighted that uh, you, you're describing this new phase, this kind of virtual bridge. Hey, uh, Stay, stay right there for a second. Tom, Joe, I'm going to come back to you in a bit. Um, but I, there's a whole bunch of people who just um, who just popped in to, uh, uh, to say more about this dynamic. And I want to make sure that we, that we uh, hold on to that because this is some rich stuff. Um, uh, Hope Wendell from the SUNY system uh, at the Coil Center uh, wanted to talk about uh, the SUNY project here. Can you, can you say a few words about that, please? Sure. Can you hear me okay? That's fine. Okay, great. So um, what you were just talking about is, and actually they were just celebrating it at a big meeting with Ampe um, and mentioned actually your collaboration, I think. Um, oh, nice. We've been doing a virtual exchange with COIL since 2006. And so, you know, when the pandemic hit, this working together and having international student teams um, collaborating on UN sustainable development um, projects and problems and um, having students work together and learn how culture sort of interacts with working together has been actually an amazing retention tool for um, professors and for classes and for students and for them to feel a little bit closer in the world right now because of the pandemic and you know we had a group in Cancun who had a hurricane this fall and they were connecting with students from Rochester who were dealing with police brutality and they came together and really had this incredible <laughs> opportunity of cultural empathy and humility for each other and and also working on a problem um, together. And so I think that reimagining the space is is big and is happening. And um, students, you know, if we just sort of get out of their way, they're already doing it. And I think uh, these kind of international opportunities are really where we need to go, honestly, just to make a um, someone prepared to work in the 21st century. It's really all about being able to talk to your um, parts person in China or wherever they are. And um, so doing this kind of work is also so much fun. Um, connecting with people in other places. I know Patrice, who's also on the call, yeah. she used to be a part of this too. So, yeah. no, thank you so much for saying that. Uh, I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Uh, hang on, while I have the two of you here. Speaking of fun, speaking of fun, you can't escape the uh, idea of fun. So, what I wanted to do now is I wanted to actually just quickly pick one of you um, to give uh, a surprise present to. And so I'm just randomly going through, uh, you know, everybody here. And let me see, is Kyle Tuck here? Do we have Kyle? Let me see. 
I think we do. Let's see if we can bring up Kyle. Hey, Kyle. Would you like a free T-shirt or the free copy of Academia Next? Your choice, my friend. <laughs> dizzy, dizzy moment. It could go either way. It could go either way. Oh well, well, here it comes. It comes to you, Kyle. Absolutely. After our call, we will set this up and do a socially distance mail procedure so that you can have a copy of the book. I'll follow up with you, Kyle, to get the uh, info about the. Uh, where you live and all kinds of other privacy violations I can accomplish. Um, <laughs> thank you, Kyle. See, that's, that's part of this, is that this is fun. You know, this is, we should be having fun. That's a key principle of this. And some of these webinars was dead, 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 anti-fun pits into the discussion, <laughs> but, but we have much more fun. Um, we also have more questions. Uh, Kate, this one's, this one's from you, or for you. This is from uh, Martha Snyder at uh, Nova, Southeastern says, when you're talking about virtual immersion, are you suggesting some sort of AR, VR, MR pre-experience? That's a great question, and that's on the table. Not necessarily. We do have uh, we have reality, like virtual reality labs at SMU that we could certainly take into account. Um, but at a very basic level, it's it's recreating a little bit of a study abroad experience. It could be. Um, many tours. It could be um, conversations with folks at different organizational and educational settings, say at Trinity College in Dublin or, you know, wherever we might be, um, maybe getting into the big libraries of different parts of the world. So it's not necessarily virtual reality, but it is virtual. Um, that That's not off the table, though, I would say. Thank you for the answer. And, um, and mm -hmm. that's a great question. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd, um, I'd love to see how these how these all blur. And in just a few minutes, we, we shifted from talking about how to unplug and what not to use to how to use this to knit the world together. Uh, I, I think all of these are, are really on the table right now. There was a great comment from some a student recently, or I, I'm, maybe it was a professor saying, you know, it got to the point where they didn't even think of themselves as being working virtually. And that was pretty amazing to that, that they just felt like they were working together, whether it was getting to know each other in World of Warcraft or working on their project in Slack together or a Google Doc or whatever it was, but they were just working. It wasn't thinking about it in terms of, you know, one dimension versus another. Yeah. It, it, there is this blending that is happening. Hope you make a great um, point there. And, and one of the challenges I'll have in delivering this virtual immersion course in the summer is that it will be taught from a hybrid perspective. So mm -hmm. I'll be in person, some students will be in person, and then there will be some simulcast via Zoom. And so uh, one of the tricks, I think we all you know talk about Zoom fatigue and that kind of thing. One of the tricks is gonna be to make sure that Zoom and the simulcasting is conducted in a way, the modality is very engaging and it has that experiential component um, as best as can be done with the limits of a hybrid scenario or a simulcast hybrid scenario, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, well, that's a really good point. Um, well, I think though that um, one thing to, that students are figuring out how to, that, that they don't necessarily have to be on Zoom to connect to each other and to work as a team. And I, I sometimes we have a crutch of needing to be synchronous to make it all work. But and sometimes the synchronous um, event or the time to meet is is to to get that trust going and then being able to do asynchronous and the fluidity of going from one to another um, is, is something that seems to, the more people seem to be able to work together, they can sort of have that um, fluid. And I think what I see professors doing is that they're coaching their students how to do that. And that's sort of like be, this way in which um, we're all learning how to work in this more fluid realm. So that, you know, when, if you're working with somebody from India or um, 
wherever, even though the time difference is huge, that there is there is ways in which that you can keep the flow going. So, yeah, yeah that's a good point. Uh, in the in the uh, in the chat, Rhea Kelly mentions that uh, she had uh, her daughter uh, is using uh, computer gaming to socialize, mm -hmm. uh, and that's an interesting example of flow uh, as well. I wanted to bring up um, one of the best writers and interviewers in higher ed. Period. I wanted to bring up Jeff Young uh, from Ed Surge, and and partly so that I could discover he's growing a beard. Oh my gosh, uh, this, this is the future trends is ahead of the curve. I had to. I, I've learned so much from you, Brian. Um, not not as much as I should have about the beard, though. Uh, you know, because I've got some some distance to go there. Um, hey, congratulations on five years! That's wonderful, and you have have been an inspiration to you know, I, I to, to to me for sure as a moderator. And as you know, and as some of the people here in this group know, you actually inspired me to copy you, which I am, uh, I, with all, you know, with, with all respect from the beginning as, as we ran Ed Surge Live as a monthly video forum. And um, we actually are just kind of, right now we're sort of in a little bit of a break on that. So would love to hear your ideas uh, and hear, hear some ideas about whether and how to continue that. But, but frankly, you've, uh, you win. You you got a great community here, and you have um, you have gotten so many incredible guests. And I will also just say you are uh, just a, a teacher and and someone who can just facilitate these conversations in a way that I think kind of sees everyone and includes so many people. And I think you know I think people appreciate that more and more with all the strife that we've been through this past year. But you've been doing it before that. So I don't know. Um, I would. I, I guess though. I think you asked me to want me to ask you questions, which I, I always am happy to, to ask. Okay. Well, so first, let me just say thank you for the kind words. Uh, I really love being uh, on your programs, um, and um, and I really really enjoyed them. And I thought you did great. Uh, so I'm I'm glad to see that. And I'm deeply deeply flattered. You, you'll learn, Jeff. One of the great things about a beard is my blushes kind of disappear. Um, that's so. that's handy. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can, can I just, uh, Kate? Uh, Hope do you want to stay on the stage for a bit more? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, whatever is easy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Just th throw some questions our way. Um, sure. So, yeah, and, and those who don't know me, um, I'm uh, at the at, at Ed Surge covering higher education and and change and all kinds of of the kinds of issues you all debate here, and and explore. And we, um, I'm curious, Brian. And, and of course, my first guest, first question was going to be, you know, other than me, who was your favorite guest? But since so many of your guests are here, <laughs> I'm not going to put you on the spot like that. Um, but I, I do, um, I, I am curious about what, how your thoughts on what it is you're doing here have changed in the five years, if at all. Because, you know, my guess is that by doing it this often, A, you must have had moments where you're like, do I want to keep going? But you did. And you probably did because it wasn't the exact same thing you did last year or last month. And so what is it that it's changed about the way you think about what it is that this is about? Um, I think a, a few things changed. One is that we've become more and more immediate um, as as events have happened, we we had, for example, one session uh, right after Charlottesville. Um, uh, I don't know if a good analogy for this, but March slash fiasco, um, and that shook people up. They really wanted to respond to that. Uh, we had a question at the New Media Consortium went down, and people really wanted to respond to that. Um, and during this past year, we've had um, it, this. I, I think the forum served as a good venue for people to talk about what was happening with the pandemic and then what was happening with racism and anti-racism. And, and so we, you know, we're looking ahead to the future. And to do that, we have to grapple with the present. But I think that the present became a lot more immediate. Uh, and and we, we kind of became a, a, a sounding board, uh, a, a kind of a reflexive uh, membrane for people to 
um, to bounce off of and to project onto during events. I've actually been thinking about reserving one session a quarter just for live events like that. Um, mm -hmm. And we may just do that, um, depending. But that's that's one of the big changes. Uh, I guess a, a second change is that on the one hand, we spend more and more time immersed in more and more video, both video conferencing as well as taking you know television and, and, and YouTube and so on. Um, but our standards seem to get higher and higher, and we we get get served a lot of terrible content. Uh, I was just on a webinar yesterday, and I won't name the source of it. Uh, but, we, but participants weren't allowed to see each other. We weren't allowed to talk to each other. We couldn't see the number of people who were there. And people posed questions. We couldn't see those questions. And it, it was kind of like it was like being in restraints. It, it was it was like. Um, um, being drugged, not in a good way. It, it felt uh, uh, it was incapacitating and frustrating. And I think people see a lot of that. Um, and they, they want things to get better. And our demands are higher because the, our needs are so much higher. I mean, so I think I think those are two changes. And that, that keeps me hopping to make sure that the forum experience is the best it can possibly be. Does that make sense, Jeff? It, it does. It's really thoughtful. I love that membrane uh, metaphor um as a as a way of of kind of releasing pressure slash um kind of being part of a, a of a system that that holds people together um that's that's really that's really an interesting an interesting metaphor thank yeah you. thank you um, I'm, I'm curious hope i mean you're you're in an unusual position um uh, because the SUNY system it isn't it never quite got into the system ness that the previous chancellor wanted it to? <laughs> it still it still has an enormous collaborative um, capacity, and some parts of the SUNY system do a really good job of that. Like Hoyle, uh, that's what 63, 65 campuses, four, 64. <laughs> yeah, I bracketed it. I was pretty good, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> that's a and that's an incredible variety of research universities, community colleges, technical skills. Uh, and they're just all over a pretty hefty distance, especially in winter. And I, I, yeah. Can, can I ask a version of Jeff's question to you? What, what's changed for you in the past five years for that? I mean, has there been a greater need for that kind of network behavior, or has there been any other transformation in that collaborative working process? Uh, I, I also just wanted to comment uh, when someone was talking about just you were talking about the that um, event that you were at yesterday, it kind of reminded me the way that we've put students into LMSs. And so they can't initiate anything. They can't collaborate. They can't oftentimes do all those things that we want to be able to do when we're in these kind of realms. And um, I think with uh, SUNY, it's 400,000 students. Wow. And and right now, I um, sort of we're trying to at least with Coil, we're trying to sort of rethink how you think about international collaboration and not as part of sort of a education abroad and sort of that privileged, very few people that get to travel, but thinking more of it as something that is about. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we all need to learn how to work together, and however that would look on any of those different campuses, and having the diversity officers of those various of our various campuses recognize this kind of work and 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 see it as sort of a first step of of sort of thinking about the larger context of the world and how I think the pandemic and also what's happened with looking at systemic racism has made people it's sort of, you can take what's happening in the world and sort of open that up. And then you also get to pull in all of these things that we're dealing with locally and see what's happening, you know, with p police brutality in the Dominican Republic and then how it can be can be um, reflected back to us in Rochester, New York. And for our students to see that they are part of this larger landscape, 
than just their county or their backyard um, seems to make a huge impact and difference to them, whether or not they travel at all or anyway. Um, but in terms of, I think, you know, they the Sunni people think of themselves as a federation because everybody is sort of has their own fiefdom. And but right now it's really tough because enrollment's down everywhere. And so people are scratching their heads. How how do we keep enrollment going and what does that look like? And um how do we make it very vital? And one of the big things we did with COIL this past summer, we had this thing called the Learning Commons, the COIL Global Learning Commons, where students got to learn about storytelling and then they applied it to a, a UN Sustainable Development Goal and learned about that with the lens on history or economics. And then they took that and they worked with an NGO and um, they developed a product for the particular NGO that they needed. And wow. um, so the students were, they had the responsibility of making either a, a film, a short video for um, Ghana to use now um, nationally to share about accessibility, or um, they, they did plays so that for um, street theater to explain concepts and or all, diff all these different things. So to me, the students, actually one of the things we heard back from the students was they were really excited to find out about, you know, all these things happening in the world, but also across the state of New York and finding out about students from different um, parts of their whole system that they didn't know about. And let me, let me pause yeah. you just for a second. Um, I, because this is fantastic. And I'm thinking, why haven't I had you as a guest on the program before? Um, <laughs> I mean, this is, what, you, what, you're, what you've just done is you brought together so many so many strands. I mean, you've brought together this, this sense of immediacy and urgency that people use video, live video, to talk about something that is happening to them right now. So if it's in the DR or Rochester, New York, police brutality, for example, or questions of diversity and equity. And you've tied that nicely to, to these questions of how we can actually use this well and make it work. And then connected to the international aspect all at once. I, I, I think that's, it, I, I would say it's like, Jeff, she's talking about something, it feels like she's outlining something that's emerging now that we don't have a name for, but that in a few years we'll all expect. It's funny because actually one of the one of our collab our coil coordinators, um, Sally Mamiado from um, Portland State, said, in a way, what coil does in doing virtual exchange is sort of like a invitation from the future to to, to have this kind of work and to be doing it in a fluid way. Um, uh, hang on, I need I need to pause you because speaking of the future, we have two directions here. One of them is. I need to find out who, let's see, uh, we have Kelvin, Kelvin Bentley. I'm going to have to get Kelvin a shirt before we run out of shirts completely. <laughs> and he's going to need that because he is someone who is really good with fashion and we can, you know, we can do that. But the other, I, I mean, if, if I could put to all of you this question, oh, let me just turn this around and, and I want to ask all of you, uh, Jeff, if you could take the first whack at this, this would be great, but I, I want to hear from everybody. How do we, how do we make this, um, what we're doing here? How do we make this more international or transnational, in a way? We we've we've had guests, we've had participants from, uh, from parts of Europe and from Africa. We've had some from Australia and uh, and, and, and Asia, but the forum remains very very U.S. centric and North America centric. I guess for this, because we can uh, Mexico. How how do we globalize? How do we make this really more, um, more international? Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Ten seconds to come to the perfect. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you could try doing a couple different. Um, you could move the, the time a couple times and maybe have it kind of featuring, you know, like try to move it to a, accommodate some folks in different time zones. Although people, there's 
people will stay up if they or or get up earlier, whichever way, to join you if they really need to. I think pe people here have probably done that for to be in collaboration. So it's not absolutely, but I, that's one idea, and to theme it so that you're trying to to actually take your show on the road, but just by moving the time zone, you might get to China or Korea or some other places where really interesting things are going on. I, that was more than 10 seconds, but I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> I might have to disappear in a couple of minutes to get to another meeting, but um, this has been so awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. How about the, how about the rest of you all? What, what do you think? Oh, in, in the chat, people, uh, Martha Stutter is asking for more uh, co connections and collaborations to invite people. Um, Hope wants us to talk with the uh, COIL coordinators. Let's do that. Uh, I'd be glad to do this. Uh, Tom cautions us that we might be more insular. Uh, Mathieu uh, thinks we should do sessions in other languages. And thinking about that, Mathieu, but wondering um, you know, what, which language would really be good. I want to do Chinese, uh, but we don't have any traction uh, in, in the Republic. You know, I think about, um, I participate in an international interdisciplinary think tank and the roadshow idea that he was just talking about is interesting because in this particular sense, um, when I participate and say, if you've heard of the PI, um, the, um, basically the media of higher education and innovation, that's based in the UK. Some of the topics that are interesting to those in say Europe versus Asia may look different than what our agenda items are here, or it might be a different framing of issues that are interesting here um, to maybe get some perspective from folks in different parts of the world as to topics they would want to hear more about. Mm -hmm. So if you have some um, people that attend here, maybe have some kind of a, a researching of interest areas for them um, that could also be helpful. But for the UK, it's like, because they're six hours ahead, it may be that you're looking at some events that happen at different times of the day. And of course, Asia is, you know, in a different time zone as well, of course. So those are some ideas. These are great ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. I've, I've held you on stage for a long time. Let me give you a rest so you can uh, get a chance to uh, relax a bit. Uh, Mathieu adds that we should caption a foreign language. Let me, let me see what I can do about that. Uh, we're thinking about captioning, which is tricky. Uh, let me see what we can add um, about that. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, Elena, yeah, Esperanto, it's, it's, it's true. Um, it's fine people, but it's just, it hasn't scaled. Uh, if you all want to uh, really check into a great cultural artifact, you want to find, there's a horror movie from the early 60s starring William Shatner, which is filmed entirely in Esperanto, uh, which is a blast. Uh, ASL, Elena, I've been thinking about doing this, um, about doing a session with maybe good, uh, is it Guadalet, Guadalet, the uh, um, uh, ASL campus in uh, DC? Um, Gallaudet, thank you, thank you. Uh, it, it's in a French name in America, and I'm always afraid for where it's been, you know, where it's been um, Maybe that would be something we should do. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Um, I, I, I have to think we're somehow this party, a sign of the good parties, they go really fast. Um, and we are going really, really quickly. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, we've uh, touched on a whole series of topics. Before we go, let me just ask, what else should we be thinking about for the next five years? Because I'm a futurist. The Future Transform is about the future. And we've got to look ahead, we've got to look ahead further. So what does this look like in 2026? And I, I had a few ideas just to toss at you. Uh, one was the idea of um, having a K through 12 version. Another idea was having an international version, which we've been talking about. Uh, another idea uh, is talking about us getting um, some more sponsors and some more partnerships. Um, what else, what else do you think we should be doing? What else should we look like in uh, in the next five years? If you want to join the uh, uh, join me up here, you, you know how comfortable it is. Just press that button and you'll be right up. Tom tells us that everything's on the table. Well, well, I guess that's true. Margie mentions uh, newer technologies, so I'm always looking for that. Always looking for that. 
Oh, Elena, brilliant, 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 brilliant. Um, the biggest growing population in the U.S. is uh, of um, uh, Hispanic and Latino uh, population. So maybe we should have one that is in Spanish. Um, thank you. Martha has this great broad vision. She wants us to humanize education by partnering with global education organizations. Um, if you have any contact you'd like us to pursue, please let me know. I'd like to see that. But a few ideas right now. Um, Kenan, by the way, Kenan, I really appreciate your point before about uh, um, globalism and its uh, shadow of uh, uh, colonialism. I really appreciate that. I didn't want to miss that. Um, but thank you. And uh, partnerships, yes. Um, well, let me, uh, um, or a VR session. Sam, you're, you're, you're ahead of me. This is something I've been thinking about. Uh, would be great to do this uh, as, uh, as a VR event. Uh, and there are a few different tools to, to play with and to explore about that. Multiple realms, indeed. Uh, global panels. We've done a couple of these, Vanessa, and we really should do more. We really should do more. I like the sound of that. All right. Well, we have time for one, one more giveaway, one more thing to hand out to folks. And let's see. Do we have David Ron here? Is David the bus? Let's take a look if we have David. Hello, David. I think what you get is a copy of Academia Next, shipped right to you in Ohio. I'll contact you so I can figure out where exactly you live in Ohio and, uh, and get this to you ASAP. Kate mentions a really important point. I keep thinking about the large gap between how people like us use tech and how for most faculty technology is still alien and scary. This is true. This is true. It is a large gap. It's something that we really, really need to bear in mind. Um, I'm wondering if we should do something like a uh, you know, intro to uh, good video work and maybe uh, welcoming folks who are still new to it. Um, and try and show them some good techniques, and some good practices. Uh, Tom mentions a student who's afraid of copy and paste. Now, well, that's the thing about community college and good ed higher education is you get to educate everybody. Friends, this has been fantastic. It's been an absolute treat uh, just to spend this time with you. Um, thank you, thank you very much for each of you taking all this time with us but more importantly, for helping make all of this happen. Together, we've created something extraordinary, something unique, something very, very special, something that helps a lot of people. Thank you all for participating in this two-week award, for co-creating with us. Please enjoy the rest of the day. Above all, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and we'll see you for another great five years. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.